Good day chaps. So today's video is one of the internet favourites, the Tortoise, an assault tank from World War II and one of the largest vehicles made. Although it never saw combat service, it did provide valuable data for future designs. The origins of the Tortoise class of assault tanks go back to 1942 with a desire by the War Office, the forerunner of today's Ministry of Defence, for a vehicle to run parallel in concept to the shelled area tanks such as the A-20, A-21 and eventually the A-22 Churchill and parallel work to the Special Vehicles Development Committee who made the TOG tanks. Now before we delve too deeply, we need to first dispel a few myths. Most tortoise tanks were, bar a few early drawings, designed around a casemated concept. While this might be associated with tank destroyers and assault guns, the tortoises were designed and built as tanks specifically as assault tanks, with the definition of tank being quite fluid at the time. A casemated or turretless design does not automatically designate a tank destroyer. For example, in UK parlance, tank destroyers have the title SP and were part of the Royal Artillery, such as the SP-2 Avenger. While this has been popularised in computer games such as War Thunder and World of Tanks as a tank destroyer, it was never made for this purpose. The same can be said for the American T-95 Super Heavy Tank. The second fact is there are tortoises, not a tortoise, as we'll cover later. The name applies to a class of assault tanks, and several of Nuffield's designs are called tortoise. And so the one at Bovington is not THE tortoise, rather A tortoise, part of a much bigger project. This new class of assault tanks were to cross broken terrain and overcome all obstacles in their way. It was widely believed by both the UK and the US that the Germans would begin to reinforce their fortified lines that stretched across their country. These were originally built in the 1930s to mirror the work done on the French Marginaux lines. The fortifications consisted of over 18,000 bunkers, pillboxes and tank traps, which stretched from the north of Germany down to the Swiss border and would prove formidable obstacles for any tanks to overcome. Thus the requirement for a new class of tank was issued. These would be assault tanks, and known in the UK as the Tortoise class. They were designed to work alongside other UK classes, notably cruisers, infantry and light tanks of the time. The requirement for such a class was first raised by the son-in-law of Sir Winston Churchill, Edwin Duncan Sands, who after being injured in the Norwegian campaign, took the position of financial secretary to the War Office. Sands coined the phrase tortoise as he wanted to emphasise the idea to a relatable subject for the engineers. One might be forgiven for inquiring as to why a gentleman with no experience in building tanks or designing them had any role to play in their development. However, those with close connections to the Prime Minister tended to have a remarkably high level of success in getting their ideas implemented, no matter how ridiculous those ideas were in hindsight. The new Tortoise class was to have an armour distribution of 60-40, with at least 6 inches of armour over the front and then 40% of this value to be applied to the sides and rear. The roof and belly were to be at least 1 inches thick as these vehicles were expected to go into environments where landmines were expected in large numbers. Thus protection for not only the floor and crew but the engine was also important. The initial gun requested would be either a 95mm howitzer or a 6 pounder gun, which at the time was considered a good gun and, in fairness, was a larger gun than many combat tanks being produced in Britain at the time. A well-armoured body of 6 inches of armour, including an armoured back section, heavy side skirts to provide protection to the tracks, and either in a turreted or casemated layout. The first real reference to the name Tortoise stems from a letter received by the Director of the Royal Armoured Corps from the tank board and included correspondence between the Director and Sir Miles Thomas. Thomas had been a First World War veteran serving in both armoured cars and the Royal Flying Corps in Egypt. Following World War I, he'd become associated with William Morris, a.k.a. Lord Nuffield, before becoming the chairman of the Cruiser Tank Production Group and a member of the Government's Advisory Committee in 1941. In a letter sent by Miles, dated the 7th of August 1943, he initially discussed that contract with the Ministry of Supply in connection with the vehicle, Tortoise, should be passed through the AFV division. He wrote that the original concept for the Tortoise was a small assault tank, very heavily armoured and carrying a six-pounder gun. 
This design was briefly covered in the DTD minutes from the period, and one design was initially to be built by Rolls-Royce, with a two-man crew, nine or more inches of armour, and a Ford engine. Vickers would also convert their Vanguard into the A38 Valiant, and it's possible that the A33 Commodore and T14 tanks were also related, as both are assault tanks. At this time, the British also realised that tanks would need other means of support. The lessons learned from the disastrous Dieppe raid the year before had begun a process that would require tanks to overcome obstacles. This would require vehicles to operate alongside tanks to support them with smoke, mine clearing, and enough firepower for immediate and terminal bunker replacement. This role went to the 79th Armoured Division, later under the famed Major General Sir Percy Hobart. It was envisioned that these new tortoises would be attached to the 79th Division as part of their specialist equipment. So let's have a look at the AT series that led up to the vehicle we have today. AT-1 was first drawn in May 1943. It had a 95mm howitzer with 360 degrees of gun traverse and was the only one in the series with a rotating turret that weighed 45 tonnes. The 95mm gun was used on several tanks, often with a C affix added, and was primarily used for laying smoke screens, as well as a useful high explosive round for bursting pillboxes. However, it would have been relatively ineffective versus any armoured target. AT-2 was also drawn at the same time, at 41 tonnes, with 8 inches of armour, it mounted a close support 95mm gun only in a casemated design. A sister to 81, they removed the turret to increase the armour layout, as the tortoises were in theory to engage static targets in front of them. This made more design sense. Next up we have AT-3. This one was armed only with machine guns and limited traverse arcs on the casemate top. It's not clear what the thinking was behind these, as they don't fit the general requirements. The weight was to be 36 tonnes. It's possible it would have acted as a support vehicle to the first designs, suppressing infantry, but there isn't much to go on. Moving on, we have 84 and 85. There is an odd pair with three machine guns facing forwards and two rear, as well as a very large 6-inch mortar and a flamethrower. These fit in closer with an assault flamethrower version than others, possibly using the mortar to lay protective smoke screens to advance. 86, drawn in May 1946, and we start to see dual-purpose guns. This one had a six-pounder with a Mollins autoloader fitted in, the same gun system as used on the Mosquito attack plane, with a blistering rate of fire. If that wasn't enough, a 20mm cannon, a flamethrower, and a pair of machine guns and cupolas were also fitted. The driver is situated in a forward section. 87 was drawn up later in June 1943, like the 86, it had a similar armament, with the guns on the side, primary differences are in the hull layout. The armour is thicker on the casemate, the hull more tapered to the front, and the commander's cupola has been moved to the other side. It retains the mod in 6 pounder gun. 88 is a new casemate design. Instead of spread out over the hull, it only took up three quarters of the top, and one side was replaced with stowage. The main gun is a conventional breech-loaded 6 pounder, located in a more centralised position, although still offset a bit, and the driver is no longer in a forward encasement, but rather located in the main body. The 20mm is retained on the other side, but the flamethrowers have been removed. 89 is drawn on the 22nd of June 1943. This one has the driver back in a narrow, forward section of the casemate, and the main gun, a 6-pounder, back in the right-hand side. A 20mm cannon is placed in a small, semi-rotating turret with 40 degrees of traverse and plus or minus 10 degrees of elevation, with a smaller turret with twin machine guns to the rear. The armour remains 8 inches to the front. The turret on top has a design flaw that would prevent the driver from escaping if the gun is depressed. Then we have 8010, which is a bit of an anomaly. The dates on the blueprint and the attached description don't match, and so it might have been redrawn or modified from an earlier piece. The vehicle now has a square casemate with guns in circular demi turrets within the main structure, giving better arcs of fire, over 55 degrees in total, and about 7 degrees of gun depression. The 20mm cannon on the other side is similar in a symmetrical emplacement with 65 degrees of gun traverse. One of the turret blisters has been removed, and now the commander, located amidship, has a low squat cupola with all round vision. 8011 and 8012 are missing from the records. The AT-13 was drawn in August 1943 and is a hybrid between the previous older ideas and the new layout. This vehicle is the most important of the early drawings as it's the transitional design between the older and later concepts. The requirements had shifted as mentioned before. 
Another vehicle was to have a 17-pounder gun, be powered by a Rolls-Royce Meteor, and have at least four points of contact between the suspension and the tracks, which were to be 32 inches wide. It is this last point which assists in working out where the AT design was at this stage, as the earlier drawings show six road wheels, while the mid to later numbers show the new suspension and guns. In order for the tortoises to cross a Bailey Bridge, which was a general requirement, the outside set of bogey wheels were to be removed, and a thinner track fitted, which would enable the tortoises to cross a 12-foot width limit on the Bailey Bridge. The AT-13 was armed with a 17-pounder gun, although still in an offset position to the right of the casemate, and opposite a 20mm or 95mm gun could be fitted. Gun traverse was good, with 40 degrees overall. The commander keeps the central location with a squat cupola, and the driver has a large, well-angled front section with good fields of view. The biggest change in the drawings is the suspension. Gone are the six road wheels and replaced with nine small road wheels in four pairs of two, with a trailing wheel at the back and she used torsion bar suspension. AT14 follows this and was drawn up in September 1943, in a similar layout to the previous one, with changes in hull shape to maximise gun angles. This was the result of the larger breech block and recoil lengths, which in turn would require more space to make the most use of the gun. The 17-pounder is fitted, but now has an external gun mantlet rather than an ingressed look, and the driver's compartment has been squished to one side, as the gun section projects over the casemated area in a lopsided manner. The 20mm cannon remains on the other side, and the commander's cupola is marginally offset. The vehicle retains the machine gun blisters on the roof. AT-15 was the first of what many of you might recognise as a classic tortoise shape. Drawn in September 1943 and coming in at 60 tonnes with 9 inches of frontal armour, the AT-15 has the distinctive shape we know and love. It was still to be armed with a 17-pounder gun, yet with a more conventional gun mantlet now mounted in the centre. A Beezer secondary machine gun is added on the opposite side and a rear-facing pair of machine guns were added to the roof. The armour was up to 9 inches on the front and the vehicle's weight was 60 tonnes. AT-15A was similar to the previous concept, drawn a week later, and is marginally longer with a redesigned engine bay with modifications to the casemate shape, which is now located slightly further back and a shorter engine deck and different exhaust ports with a ventilation layout. Otherwise she's very similar. Why the modifications were made are not recorded, although it may be to stabilise the centre of gravity. The next design was drawn on February 5th, 1944. This is AT-16. This vehicle would be the one that would become the tortoise we have today, and later given the name A39. At 72 tonnes with 9 inches of armour over the front, and the 17-pounder gun replaced with a 32-pounder gun, which is fitted in a very heavy ball mount. This gun is often touted as a 3.7-inch AA, but was in fact developed from the 55-pounder, redesignated 37-pounder, and finally 32-pounder, with the last two being the same gun with different ammunition. The suspension was also changed with eight road wheels, now more evenly spread out in a 161 configuration. Secondary armament of a ball mounted beezer on the right hand side, as well as a pair of machine guns and a fully rotating cupola on the roof. The AT16 was the only Nuffield design ever made in this class. A few more designs were made and drawn to fill the role that might be needed by the engineers. AT17 and AT18 are the last of the conventionally known drawings both mounting very heavy flamethrowers in the front superstructure and over 540 gallons of fuel pressurised by no less than seven gas cylinders. This thing would have made a church with crocodile blush and was designed to complement the others in the new assault engineer role. As for 1819 to 1825, almost nothing is known, other than the names crop up in obscure documents. It's not known if the pictures survived or have been misplaced. Although 1823 is known and appears to be similar to 1816, with just an extra machine gun mount and modified structure, drawn on the 18th of October 1944. So now we have the background to these designs and some information on each, let's delve into how these vehicles came to be the ones we have today. An order was placed for 25 vehicles. However, by 1944 the tables had turned on Germany and the defensive lines had to date been passed by relatively easy and the situation at home was also one of a more relaxed nature. With the threat of invasion over, the war was still hotly contested. The production of tanks had become more streamlined and some of the older obsolete models phased out of service. This led to a concern that tank production at Nuffields might be reduced and thus there might not be enough manpower and expertise at Nuffields to produce the tortoise 
when the time came to build them. The tank board gathered in 1944 to discuss this matter, and the solution it found was to remove another class that was not required, the self-propelled anti-aircraft tanks. These vehicles had been built on the Crusader and Centaur chassis, and originally planned for quite large numbers. But by 1944, the Allied forces had air dominance over Europe, with only sporadic German attacks, and so were not required. Fortunately for Nuffields, a requirement for bulldozer tanks was. These were to help in Europe clearing roads, filling craters and hauling broken down vehicles that was up to that point being carried out on gun tanks fitted with bulldozers such as Sherman's, which in turn prevented them from fulfilling their proper roles. The first vehicles chosen for conversion were the obsolete Crusader tanks, of which 200 to hulls were surplus, having been phased out of service. It was hoped these would be converted into bulldozers, but on inspection they had been poorly kept and stored, resulting in 500 to 600 hours of work each before they'd even be ready for adapting. The Centaur AA vehicles, however, were perfect, and so the turrets were removed, both the AA versions and many gun tanks, and converted into bulldozers, known as the Centaur Trailbreaker, which allowed Nuffields to keep the staff numbers they would require for the production of Tortoise, as well as Neptunes later. A wooden mock-up of Tortoise was made first, followed by that order of 25, although that number would be scaled down to just 12 vehicles by September 1945. Finally, only six production vehicles were finished, although it's believed up to 12 hulls would be cast in total. The Tortoise was too late to see service in the Second World War, and in all realities was not needed. The expected defensive fortifications were simply bypassed, as the Allies swept through Europe, and the majority of Germans were fighting a losing battle on the Eastern Front. The need for such a lumbering giant was no longer there. However, once the war was over, they did find a use. Two were sent over to the British Army on the Rhine, to move the tortoise, a special series of 80-ton Coles tractors were made. Each heavy-duty trailer could then be tilted to allow the vehicles easy access. After some basic firing trials to test the weapon stability, in which the large 32-pounder rounds were able to pass easily through a Panther at 1,000 yards, they were then used as testing platforms. The Allies had been rather surprised at the Soviet IS-3, seen in the Berlin Victory Parade, and it was clear that in the future heavier and more powerful tanks would be required. Thus they tested two vehicles, P-4 and P-5, named Athena and Andromeda, to test the German infrastructure for its capacity to withstand the next generation of vehicles. Athena and Andromeda were driven in urban areas to test road surfaces, as well as long journeys on the Autobahn to see how they held up to heavy vehicle usage. Other tests were done on bridges to measure structural integrity while fording tests were carried out, as well as rafting options to carry them across rivers. Once this was evaluated, at least one vehicle had its gun removed and was converted into a system for measuring ground resistance with a hydraulic jack system. The fate of these two vehicles is unknown, but both were likely later destroyed on German firing ranges. So how many vehicles were made in total? As we mentioned before, at least 12 possible castings were made. This can be established from the casting numbers on the rear upper back plate, which go up to A12. However, not all of these castings can be accounted for, and it's possible that some were imperfect and melted down. A section used for casting analysis shows wildly fluctuating numbers on the hulls, and thus it's possible the serial numbers are not sequential due to imperfect hulls later being scrapped. Of the 12 possible castings made, at least 6 became full vehicles in most respects. The first vehicle was made of soft or unarmoured steel and is currently the one at Bovington Tank Museum, known as P1, with the serial number AT104D. This vehicle differs in some ways from the others, notably it lacks the side ammunition port for reloading. P2, with the registration number JJU688, was also located at Bovington, having been donated by the Royal Military College of Science, and was an outside attraction for some time before being sent to Lulworth Range and blown up by the museum. Sadly, it's possible that the gas turbine engine was in it when it was destroyed. P3, with casting number AT-108B, remains lost. P4, AT-108B A4, was sent to the British Army on the Rhine and named Athena. P5, casting number unknown, named Andromeda, was sent to the British Army on the Rhine. And P6, casting number 108C A9, which might have been a ninth casting, was vehicle was never fitted with engines or a gun and was used as a range target at Scotland. The wreck is still there today. So as a conclusion, 
Did the tortoises ever serve a real purpose? As we discussed, much of what was written about the tortoise is misleading to outright incorrect. It was never a tank destroyer, it was an assault tank, for a very narrow field of use, similar to other aspects of the 79th. Designed to break its way through heavily fortified areas and grind its way through mines and traps to allow the tanks behind to make a breakthrough. Ultimately its greatest use was to test infrastructure, train and automotive features, as well as provide data on future transport systems for the next generation of tanks, both ours and those of the enemy. Well guys, thanks so much for listening to this ramble about the tortoises. If you did like this, give it a like or a comment, and more importantly, give it a share so we can help this channel grow. Don't forget to hit that little notification bell, it does something I'm told. We've also now got a Discord channel, so come and join that, and here you'll see lots of extra images and all the bits that we can't crop into these little videos. And until next time, toodle pip!